news and the prophetic teachings. However, if you will just subscribe by clicking the subscribe button, the bell to be notified for the next video study, and then share with others. These videos can go to countries where they are not allowed to even carry a Bible, and this will help save. Hello, this is Pam Gunderson, host of You and Him Ministries Bible Study and Christian Prophetic News. Welcome, beloved of the Lord. We are here today to go into 1 Corinthians, which is an apostle of Paul. And it consists of, and I will let you know here, I'm going to go ahead and go into my screen first. I want to pray a sin. Father, thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to go into these scriptures, Father, in Jesus' name. We give you all the glory and all the honor. Lord, I ask that you transform us through the renewing of our minds, through these scriptures, Lord, that uh, are written as a handbook on how we are to live, Father. And let me go ahead and move something here. And so we're going to go ahead. I'm going to share, your, share my screen. We just got finished with um, Romans 16. And I said we would go ahead and start working on 1 Corinthians. We're still one chapter behind the eight ball, but I'll go ahead and do the highlights for real quick here. I'll try to keep up. Uh, which is, I had gotten behind, so I do apologize. Okay, let's share my screen. And again, we're in the uh, the King James Version, and we are uh, using uh, Dr. Vernon McGee's outlines and scriptures and pop comment, uh, comment uh, <laughs> comments because of the fact that uh, we want to get through these, and while I work up some things that the Lord is speaking to me, which is going to be, I believe, the great deception that is coming upon us. Uh, so when that starts happening, I want to make sure that we have enough information. And I want to point out that uh, how it was in the days of Noah, which is what I believe this particular uh, season is that we're in right now. So let's go ahead. The first epistle to the Corinthians. Forgive the fact that we just got out of church and um, I may not be the greatest reader today. And so a broad outline of this book divides into three major divisions. Salutation, then Thanksgiving, that's verses 1 through 9. Carnalities, verses 10 through 34. Spiritualities. Um, uh, 12 through 16. Okay, he's talking chapters. So chapter 1 through 11 is carnalities. Chapter 12 through 16 is spiritual gifts. But right now we're on 1. And so there's a whole outline here. I'll leave it on the screen for a second. If you want to take a screenshot, it's right there for you. If you have a snap or snip, uh, snip it on your computer, which you may not have on your phone. You can cut that out and then print it out for yourselves, which is what I do when I want to do it. Here's another outline. I'll leave it on the screen for a little while. And the rest of the outline is right there. And I would actually show you how you can do that. It's, it's a snip thing. And you snip it, and it's right here. So it shows right up here. So you would go new, and you would cut the whole thing out like this. And then you would hit print. It says uh, new. Let me do it the right way. So I'm cutting it out. New, cutting it out. Then I'm going up here, and... Uh, I don't want to move the camera, but you hit uh, uh, right there. It'll tell you where, if you want to save it or if you want to have it print. So if you have this tool on your computer, it makes life very easy. 
but I'm going to, I don't want to save it so it's no. I don't want to save the snip. Okay, chapter one. The theme is centrality of Christ crucified, correction of divisions. And we're talking salutation and thanksgiving. First verse is Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. And Sosthenes, Sosthenes our brother. Will you notice in your Bible that the little verb to be is in italics, which means it is not in the original. It should read Paul, read, Paul called an apostle. This declares what kind of an apostle he is. He is called a, or he is a called apostle. God called him. The Lord Jesus Christ way laid him on the Damascus road. Then the spirit of God taught him yonder in the desert of Arabia. He is, is a called apostle. He didn't walk with Christ. Second verse. Okay, I, I want to read here, though. Sos Sosthenes, our brother. Apparently, Sosthenes had brought the message from the Church of Corinth, and now he is going to carry this epistle back to them. He is the one who is joining Paul in these greetings. Verse 2. And to the Church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, which all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both, both theirs and ours. Notice it is unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. It is called the church of God because he is the one who is the architect of the church. The letter is directed to the sanctified of Christ Jesus. I'm just going to do topicals. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. We need to get through. I'll be able to spend more time once we get into where we're supposed to be on time. Third verse. Third verse. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First Corinthians 1, 3. And I would suggest that uh, if you want to know more about what's going on, that you study yourself. If something pops up at you uh, while we're reading, uh, stop this video Write it down and then pray or inquire of the Lord exactly what it is that you think that he might be saying to you. Okay. As I said before, I have more light at night than I do during the daytime. So I'm having to use some artificial light so that I can even be seen. I do apologize, but it's not me. It's the scriptures we're supposed to be looking at. Reshare. Okay. Verse three. Uh, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace are always in the sequence in, in that sequence. Grace, charis, was the word of greeting in the Greek world. Peace is the word Hebrew word shalom. So we have grace in the Greek, shalom for peace. So they're both together. A form of greeting in the religious world. Paul combined these two words and lifted them to the highest level. You and I are saved by the grace of God. It is a, it is love in action. Verse 4. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. By Jesus Christ would be better translate, translated in Jesus Christ. Because it is in Christ that we have all of these blessings. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And you can see that in Ephesians 1 verse 3. This is the place of blessing. Jesus Christ should be Christ Jesus. Christ is his title, while Jesus is his human name. Christ is literally anointed which is the official appellation of the long-promised Savior. It is important to say Christ Jesus instead of Jesus Christ. It was, was to Paul. Paul tells us that he never knew him after the flesh. Verse 5, that in everything we are, ye are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, 1 Corinthians 1.5. This is what Paul is talking about in Colossians 3, verse 16, when he says, let the a uh, word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Verse 6 and 7. 6 and 7. Even as the testimony of Christ 
was in you. I want to make sure I didn't uh, clip anything off. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 6 and 7. And that uh, snippet that I just showed you, you can stop the video at any time and do the snip art, and then you can keep it in a file, and you'll have uh, all of this extra information if you want to read through it. Here he intimidates, intimates, one of the problems that this church was having, they were carnal. They were occupied with only one gift. Paul says at the very beginning that he doesn't want them to come behind in any gift. There are many gifts. Paul wants all these gifts to be manifested in the church. Waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ means that they are to be occupied with him. Verse 8. God shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says blameless. He does not say they will be faultless. There will always be someone who will find fault with you, but you are not to be worthy of blame, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the day of our Lord, uh, the day of our Lord Jesus Christ is not only referring to the present day, but to the day he will come and take his church out of the world. Paul will talk about that in this epistle also verse 9 god is faithful by whom ye were called into unto the fellowship of this son jesus christ our lord have you noticed that lord jesus christ is mentioned in this section in practically every verse actually it isn't practically every verse it is every verse this is the ninth reference to him in nine verses. It is obvious that Paul is putting an emphasis upon the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. This is a big section. I did want to bring out... There is an extended name given to our Lord here called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This gives four points of identification for him. So there is no way of misunderstanding. First, God is faithful. Men are not always faithful. Even believers are not always faithful, Faithful, but God is faithful. Then next, by whom ye were called, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We are called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The word that is important here in connection with the Lord Jesus Christ is fellowship. The word is the Greek koinonia, and it is used by Paul again and again. Koinonia can also mean a partnership, and he believes that it is the way it is used here in this ninth verse. God is faithful by whom you were called into the partnership or fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. What does it mean then to be in partnership with the Lord Jesus? For one thing, it means that in business, you own things together with him. Everything that I own belongs to Jesus Christ. It belongs to him as much as it does to me. Therefore, he is interested in what I own. Now I must confess that there was a time when I owned a few things I don't think he cared about. There was a time, he's, this is Vernon talking, there was a time when I very selfishly thought only of myself in connection with what I owned. But now, although I don't own too much, when he is in partnership with me, he is not in what you would call big business. What I have is his. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the share. And I'll go ahead and come in here on my own with this. So... Um, I have a car that I drive that is a nice car. I have a car that was a nice car and it got old. It's a 1999 Nissan uh, minivan. And uh, it has 293,000 and some miles on it. So it's paid for. And I got it back in 2006, I believe. And I've driven it all the way up to 2021. 
I then purchased, because it was old and a lot of miles, and my husband felt that it was not safe anymore. And we were told that there was something wrong with the manifold and da da da, you know, since I have found out, since I have found out, maybe not all that was the truth. So I've invested a few thousand dollars into the Nissan just in case the economy would happen to go down. Therefore, I have a car that's paid for. And just in here, just in case my hair is all over my head here, just in case the economy would go wrong, then I want to make sure that I have a vehicle that's paid for just in case I couldn't pay for my Toyota anymore. Okay. And so that's what's going on there. And so uh, I think that's a pretty good deal. And I'm going to hold on just a minute here. I want to do something. If I can, so anyway, it was my thought, and as Vern McGee is saying, yes, I have this more luxury car, uh, more expensive, but it's not paid for, and so I know it's God's car because He's let me buy it. And so I'd like to keep it. Uh, so what I did was I said, if you'll let me keep this car, Lord, I will use it uh, to pick up people at church, take, you know, take people where they need to go and stuff to use this car. This has not been my habit in all of these days uh, because of the fact that uh, in my mind's eye, if I had a passenger in my car, if I had an accident, I wouldn't. I'm. I wouldn't be happy if I got hurt. But I don't want anybody else getting hurt. Maybe I'm not the best driver in the whole wide world, and so I just never felt to have passengers other than my husband, and of course, you know, I would take him places or he'd take me places. But my house is the Lord's. The car is the Lord's. Everything that I have, God has given me to use. And he has the right to take them away. But I've noticed that when God uh, looks like he's taking something away, but usually what's happened with me, he's brought me a step up. So don't fight him. Do not fight the Lord. If he looks like something, you're going to lose something, uh, don't fight him. Because you might find out that he has something even more and better for you. It's been it's been my experience. I've had to leave some places and leave things behind. But as I've gotten to the new place, the things were restored and some of them were nicer than what I had left behind. So that's kind of the way it works. Okay, let's go back. That's just my philosophy. And I think that it's the truth. Okay, the division, next division is uh, divisions and party spirit. So verse 10, centrality of Christ crucified corrects divisions. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing and that there is no divisions among you, but yet that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Notice that the Lord Jesus Christ is again mentioned in this verse. This epistle emphasizes the Lordship of Christ. Verse 11. Oh, uh, let's go back to verse 10. Let there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. What is the same mind? Well, it is the mind of Christ. See that in Philippians 2, verses 5 through to 8. Now, verse 11, 1 Corinthians 1, 11. For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. The word for contentions here is Eris, E-R-I-S. Now, Eris was the goddess of strife and wrangling. There was strife, quarreling, schisms, and wrangling in the church at Corinth. Paul got his information firsthand. He named his source. He said he got back his information from Chloe. My friend, if you are going to make a charge, back it up with your name like Chloe did. Uh... My daughter was going to a church. They loved the church. And so all of a sudden, they had a schism or what is called a 
uh, the church split. Um, they s suspected who it was that caused the split. And she is heartbroken by it because she lost the pastor that she loved. These kind of contentions are very, very horrible. And you need to stay away from it and have the same mind. And because if you are uh, causing a church split or religion or any of this kind of thing, uh, I believe that you are in danger of a real judgment and, and you need to repent of it and try to. Okay, this is what one of my pastors said to me once, and I love it. He said, take a pillow, a feather pillow. I don't know what's going on here. Take a feather pillow and cut it open and sprinkle the feathers just let them fly now gather all those feathers back and put them back in that pillow because this is exactly what's happened you split a church and everything scatters including usually the shepherd when you strike the shepherd the sheep will scatter it's wrong don't do it if you want to start your own church, keep your mouth shut and just leave. Don't take them, the people with you. Don't cause contentions. It's a bad thing. Okay. Verse 12. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Paulus, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Divisions were being caused by believers following different leaders of the church. They formed cliques around certain men. In one group were the proud pupils of Paul, and another the adoring admirers of Apollos. And there were some who liked Simon, Peter, or Cephas, and they formed the chummy cult of Cephas. So you can see they're having favorites, and this causes contentions. I'm not going to read that poem. This may sound corny and very silly, but unfortunately, feuding and fussing go on inside churches. This is what they were doing in the Corinthian church. Now, Paul tackles this problem, and he asks, well, let's read this. What is this? Okay, here we go. Oh, the Martins and the Coys, they were reckless mountain boys, and they took up family feuding when they meet. They would shoot each other quicker than it took your eye to flicker. They could knock a squirrel's eye at 90 feet. Oh, the Martins and the Coys, they were reckless mountain boys. But old Abel Martin was the next to go. Though we saw the Coys a coming, he had hardly started running, for a volley shook the hills and laid him low. After that, they started out to fight in earnest, and they scarred the mountains up with shot and shell. They were uncles, brothers, cousins. They say they bumped them off by dozens. Just how many bit the dust is hard to tell. Oh, the Martins and the Coys, they were reckless mountain boys. At the art of Kilton, they became quite deft. They all know us they shouldn't do it, but before they hardly knew it, on each side they only had one person left. The Martins and the Coys, Ted Weems and Al Cameron. This may sound corny and very silly, but unfortunately, feuding and fussing go on inside churches. This is what they were doing in the Corinthian church. Now Paul tackles this problem and he asks, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? 1 Corinthians 1.13. The answer is obvious. Of course, Christ is not divided. Anything that breaks up the unity in Christ has something wrong with it, regardless of what it is. The crucifixion of Christ is the bedrock of Christian unity, and it is absurd to cont contemplate establishing unity, unity on any other basis. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? In this instance, uh, we do not believe Paul is referring to water baptism, which was always in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Rather, he was referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, in other words, he was talking about the person who laid hands on the person for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, it, so when they laid hands, if it were uh, Peter or Paul or Cephas or whoever, that's who they were saying they were baptized in the Spirit by. 
It, but the whole thing is they weren't. It's in Christ. Then 14 and 15. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Gaius. Plus, many should say that I had baptized in my own name. 1 Corinthians 1, 14 through 15. Here he's talking about water baptism. He's saying he didn't specialize even in the uh, in that because of a danger of folk thinking that he was baptizing in his own name. You see, he's focusing on the centrality of Christ. There are folk, even in our own day, who think the water baptism saves them, or that it actually has some mystical power that couldn't be gotten otherwise. And I baptized into the household of Steve, uh, Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. 1 Corinthians 1.16 for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. 1 Corinthians 1.17. Verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but one to us which are saved, it is the power of God. The cross divides men. The cross divides the saved from the unsaved, but it is... Uh, but it doesn't divide the saved people. It should unite them, you see. Paul makes it very clear that his method was not the wisdom of the words of the world, not in the method of dialectics of divisions or differences or opinions or theories, but he just presented the cross of Christ. That brought about a unity of those who were saved. To those who perish, the cross of Christ is foolishness. But to the saved man, it becomes the power of God. The cross of Christ divides the world, but it does not divide the church. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to understanding the understanding of the prudent. Where is it the wise? Where, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? But after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 19 through 21. Notice that it is not foolish preaching, but the foolishness of preaching. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, and to the Jews a stumbling block, and into the Greeks foolishness. 1 Corinthians 1 verses 22 and 23. Notice that Paul divides mankind into two great ethnic groups, the Jews and the Greeks, meaning Gentiles. He recognizes the twofold division. The Jew represented religion. He had a God-given religion. The Jews felt that they had the truth, and they did as far as the Old Testament was concerned. The problem was that it had become just a ritual to them. They had departed from the scriptures and followed tradition, which was their interpretation of the scriptures. The power was gone. Therefore, when Christ appeared, they asked for a sign. Rather than turning to their scriptures, they asked for a sign. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign, no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days in the three nights and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew 12, verses 38 through 40. The Lord Jesus gave to them the sign of resurrection. The Greeks were the Gentiles. They rep represented philosophy. They were the lovers of wisdom. They said they were seeking the truth. They were searching and scanning the universe for truth. They were the rationalists. While the Jews ended up in ritual, the Gentiles ended up as rich, rich rationalists and had to conform to a pattern of reason. What is the truth, asked the fatalistic pilot. They can ask the same question, and philosophy is still asking that question. Philosophy still has no answers to the problems of life. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Let's see. Uh, someone has defined philosophy as a blind man in a dark room looking for a black bat that isn't there. Hmm.
Man today thinks he has few answers, where otherwise today it is good a good question to ask. You see, God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. This is a tremendous statement. But we preach Christ crucified, and to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. The Jews found the cross to be a stumbling block, a scandal on. They wanted a sign. They wanted someone to show the way. And they wanted a pointer, a highway marker. To the Greeks or Gentiles, the cross was foolishness and absurdity. They considered it utterly preposterous and ridiculous and contrary to rational, worldly system. In Rome, there had been found a caricature of Christianity. Uh, there has been found a caricature of Christianity, a figure on the cross with an ass head. Also in our day, our Savior is being ridiculed. Now, Paul introduces another class of mankind, unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks. These are the called the elect. They have not only heard the invitation, they responded to it. And they have found in the cross of Christ the wisdom and power of God, which has transformed their lives made them and made them new men. The Lord Jesus molded 11 men, then called Paul of Tarsus and sent them out. They took the gospel to, to Corinth with its sin, to Ephesus with its religion. Over 1,900 years, the gospel has been going around the world and it is the only help and the only hope of mankind. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how, they, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. First Corinthians 1, verses 24 through 26. Some folk like to give emphasis to the prominent folk who have accepted Christ, the entertainment greats, the leaders in industry, and the prominent in government. But God majors in average people. He is calling simple folk like you and me. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. 1 Corinthians 1, 27. This does not mean these men are foolish. It means they seem foolish to the world. They are not weak. They are weak in the estimation of the world. This is God's method. He even chooses the base, and that's the lowly, the people at the bottom of the, uh, in the bottom of the ship who work the ship, who work the controls. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. First Corinthians 1, verses 28 through 29. We do not have a thing to glory about, but of him who are ye, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, whom God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.30. Oh, my friend, he is everything that we need. We wish we could get that over to you. He has been made to us wisdom. He is our righteousness. He is our sanctification and our redemption. Whatever it is that you need today, you will find in him. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, glorieth let him glory in the Lord, 1 Corinthians 1, 31. Our glory should be in the Lord. We should glory in the Lord Jesus Christ today. What do you glory in? What are you boasting of today? Are you boasting of your degrees, of your wisdom, of your wealth, of your power? Are you boasting today of your position and your character? You don't have a thing of which you can boast. And we know you haven't, and I haven't, but we can boast of Christ. He is everything. He is everything that we need. And I'm going to stop there so that uh, we can go into chapter two during a next reading. Anyway, I'm Pam Gunderson, host of You and Him Ministries, Bible Study, and Christian Prophetic News. These readings are going along with the daily manna that I put up on Facebook. You can reach me at 360. 
Pam at you and him dot info, Pam at you and him ministries dot com. I'm not going to give you a, a, your uh, email because it's, it's getting to be too much. And uh, you and him ministries dot com. You can ask a question down there. You can ask for prayer. And the mailing address is 800 East Wishka Street. Suite 213, Aberdeen, Washington, 98520. And I'm going to put up the front of these videos as soon as I have time to edit them. And you will see the Daily Man on the front and then go in. The video will be there with the readings. Anyway, God bless and you have a blessed day.